Today's show is sponsored by Essentia Analytics, an award-winning fintech company that provides AI-driven behavioral analytics services to professional investors and allocators of capital. Essentia works with leading active equity investment teams to measure, improve, and promote their decision-making skill and helps asset owners and allocators assess portfolio managers based on demonstrated investment skill, not just past performance. To learn more about their revolutionary approach to unlocking behavioral alpha in active equity management, visit Essentia-Analytics.com. Welcome to the Compounders Podcast. On this show, we explore the topic of compounding from various angles, including through interviews with public and private company executives, investors who focus on compounders, and newer investment firms that are building a business they hope will become more valuable over time. All opinions expressed by your hosts and the podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of SNN or its affiliates. This podcast is for informational purposes only. It is not investment advice and should not be relied upon for any investment decisions. We are not recommending the purchase or sale of any securities. The hosts and guests may be beneficial owners of the securities discussed. You should not assume that the securities discussed are or will be profitable. My guest on the show today is Max Sykes, the portfolio manager of the Gabelli Financial Services Opportunities Fund. Mac has been with Gabelli for over 15 years and runs a portfolio that is focused on the financial services industry. We haven't had many chances to discuss banks on this podcast, so I was excited to speak with Mac about the major tailwinds he and his team believe are supporting the companies in the portfolio, how technology is transforming and impacting the incumbents in the financial services industry, the future of Berkshire Hathaway as we approach an inevitable change in leadership, portfolio construction, and especially concentration, and how the big money center banks are positioned to weather the next credit cycle. Mac mentioned a number of securities on this podcast. The only one I own is Berkshire Hathaway. And without any further ado, here's my conversation with Mac Sykes of Gabelli Asset Management. Mac, the foundation of your fund is to invest behind the tailwind of American prosperity. Can you talk about the elements of that tailwind that you're aiming to benefit from? Thanks, Ben. It's great, it's great to be here today. Uh, maybe I could just give a little intro on our firm. Uh, Mario Gabali founded it. It's a value investing firm. We re- manage about $30 billion today, uh, and I am a part of the portfolio management team of about 40 professional uh, and uh, lead a uh, financial services ETF, GABF. I also uh, am a portfolio manager for a number of the other funds as well, um, so support the group. Um, so we launched GABF in May of 2022, we rang the New York Stock Exchange bell in the inauguration for it. Uh, so that was terrific. But the foundation for launching this fund was this idea about the American tailwind of prosperity. And this was a term that Buffett uh, coined several years ago. And, and it really goes to talk about the American system that we live in. Uh, it's an incredible economic system. Um, and if you think about kind of what powers that, it's our rule of law, it's our entrepreneurial thinking. Uh, just the remarkable capitalist kind of society in terms of resource allocation and an incredible competitively corporate environment. And we measure some of this evidence of increase in, in wealth um, at the household level. And so if you think about in 1971, that total was about $5 trillion. Today, it's over $150 trillion. All right. So we've had wars, pandemics, all kinds of disruptions, recessions, et cetera. But the American system of economics has been an incredible power component driving both wealth and corporate development over time. Uh, so we feel pretty comfortable as using that as a backdrop for our thesis and thematic approach to what we do in terms of picking stocks. And financial services companies specifically are well positioned uh, to benefit from the American tailwind. If you think about wealth and asset management, payments, insurance, specialty companies like S&P Global, um, so really uh, well levered to kind of this overall theme and, and prosperity that's occurred uh, for a long time. And just to pull out, you know, one stock in that idea, uh, one of my favorite companies, WR Berkeley, is especially uh, insurance firm. Uh, if you go to page 11 of their 2022 annual, you'll see that over time, since 1974 to 2022, achieved a return of almost 24% annually for shareholders against 12.5% for the S&P. So there's nothing special about that company, just an incredible entrepreneurial family, great capital allocation, and benefiting from this American tailwind of prosperity, and we're looking to uh, take advantage of that. 
and the huge wealth transfer between baby boomers and their kids is a theme you also highlight in your presentations. From a high level, what kind of companies are in position to take advantage of that dynamic? Right. So I think we're all aware of the demographic change that's occurring, whether it's the you know, kind of this aging baby boomer population, which accumulated significant wealth over time, uh, to the younger generations. Uh, and the Fed has talked about this number being, you know, the multi-trillions and, and a transfer of wealth over the next decade or so of a 16 trillion specifically, and that's about 1.6 trillion per year on average. And if you think about kind of the infrastructure spend today, you know, comparing that to, you know, this wealth transfer, it's pretty significant in terms of those numbers. Uh, and so we see, you know, good tailwinds in terms of wealth and asset advice uh, going forward, innovation in terms of products, alternatives, et cetera, um, and nice tailwinds there in terms of asset gathering. And so we like the companies like Charles Schwab, Morgan Stanley. Uh, they're well levered to this. One of our favorites is Interactive Brokers. And here you have a firm growing at 20% plus clients in, in client growth annually. They have 70% operating margins. And so this is the fundamental output of your favorite technology company in terms of margins and growth, but at a 15 times multiple financial services. So a wonderful opportunity and, and plenty of visibility in terms of growth and outlook and specifically related to a lot of these trends that we see in uh, wealth transfers. In, as you think about that American prosperity framework and the tailwinds that you are um, and these major themes and tailwinds that you're trying to ride. I'm interested in how that influences portfolio construction. I mean, is it, you, you think that banks are really well positioned for, to take advantage of this and you overweight banks. I'm just trying to get a sense of like, as you're creating a portfolio, how do the themes that you, you know, that are the backdrop for the, the whole strategy, how are they influencing the way the portfolio is put together? Right, so I think the, the American Tailwind provides an incredible corporate backdrop, consumer backdrop overall, uh, and that's just our confidence in the U.S. economy. Then we dig deeper into that, and we look for themes such as the wealth transfer. Uh, we look at inflation impacts, higher rates on insurance. Uh, and so there we look at the insurance sector, and we wouldn't necessarily just buy a beta stock, a beta component of insurance, although we do like what's happening there. But then we go a bottom-up fundamental research process where we look at these companies, uh, we look at the valuations, we look at the historic execution, and we've built a portfolio uh, of companies that we think are some of the best within their sectors, within the business, and well-leveraged kind of to this theme. So we are bottoms up. Uh, we have about 50 companies in the portfolio, excuse me, about 40 companies in the portfolio. Uh, and that's moved around. And we think that uh, you know, that's a, a good number for us to monitor. I have a lot of support here at the organization, but I find that kind of a narrow, uh, selective list of durable, competitive companies uh, will drive returns. And then in aggregate, um, we, we put it all together. Um, and in, in the start of the year, uh, that portfolio had a PE of about 15 times earnings. You compare that to about 21 times earnings for the S&P, 16 times earnings for the S&P financials, which is the beta product. Uh, and that is against an earnings per share growth outlook of 14% this year, So, which is above both of those indices. So we think we own great value mm. with a great fundamental outlook uh, and, and, and pretty good multiples too as well. So a very competitive portfolio within this and, and good long-term trailwinds and visibility in terms of earnings growth. Given that combination of quality and value, which I think is hard to find in, in most markets. You know, this seems like it'd be a compelling, you know, investment class for people. Uh, so if someone's trying to figure out where this strategy fits within a broader asset allocation, where does a fund that invests at least 80% of its assets and financial services fit in your mind? Right. Well, a couple of things on that front, you know, even though we are a quote unquote sector fund. Um, you know, you, you think about a company like Berkshire Hathaway, for instance, it's one of our top holdings. You know, there's a company could be broken up into five S and P companies in itself, right? So incredible diversification, incredible capital allocation and, and long term track record. So uh, there's a company that's kind of, you know, in a narrow base, but we know it's pretty diversified. Uh, another company, JP Morgan, same, they do an incredible business in payments, credit cards, uh, Custody, wealth management, asset management, investment banking. So very well diversified. They could easily be broken up. So you get these exceptional companies uh, that really are more diversified than what you would think of in terms of a pure financial 
uh, product. And then again, it, it, these are these are leveraged to really nice growth things, very visible, um, and and a history of execution. And we think they're pretty well positioned. So I, I think that it's not necessarily the most core portfolio that you want to own. Um, so I think there's some people where the S and P 500 makes a lot of sense for them, or in terms of their risk parameters, you know, a 60 40 model, or however you want to do it. But I do think that, as I said, the portfolio we've put together today is a great slice of America, very well positioned, uh, and, and should do very well over time. Uh, and if you look at since the start of our uh, inception, we've beaten both the index handily and also the S&P 500. So I think um, this should be a part of uh, an, an asset base for investors. Um, you know, we have a specific band aid and, and, a, and a focus, uh, but I, I think it's a very good value proposition going forward. I've invested very heavily in the fund as well. Um, and I, I do think it's, you know, a, a great opportunity uh, to beat the market as well. And you mentioned, you know, the benchmarks that you're using. I mean, it sounds like uh, you have an like S&P Financial benchmark. Talk to me about what you're benchmarking against, even though I, despite my my distaste for benchmark questions, it is, it is you know, relevant in this conversation to understand, you know, what how how you've chosen that benchmark. Well, um, so I mean, I think it's a natural benchmark for us to see the S&P financials. I mean, that's how we've been classified kind of on the Act 40 rules, uh, you know, and they will be changing next year. So all funds, regardless of whether sector, however you want to frame it, uh, will have to have the market benchmark in there. So you'll have to compare them. And, you know, I don't think we have to beat the S&P every year, but um, it is my goal over time to outperform it. And that's what we've done. Uh, and I think that, you know, if you start with that idea that we have, put together a portfolio that's that's kind of a better value or, or than the, you know, kind of the entirety of that market, uh, I think will generate returns over time that, that are acceptable. Um, so our goal is certainly to beat the benchmark, beat the S&P 500, uh, and, and to make a lot of money for shareholders. That's our goal. And you've mentioned that you own about 40 stocks. Um, it'd be interesting, but you the companies you've mentioned are, seem to be pretty large ones. So maybe talk to a little bit about market cap range is this is this primarily large cap will you go smaller maybe just talk about uh the universe of financial services companies you're willing to touch right um so the on balance the portfolio uh is about 70 percent weighted towards large cap uh and then you have some mid caps and some small caps in there uh, you know as we grow the fund i mean it's still smaller at this point uh we're, we're able to be a little more nimble with some of the the names and there's probably some inefficiency kind of at the lower end where we've seen uh, we own a company with it's trading at four dollars a share with an nav of over eight you know and so uh but you know we, we couldn't put a lot of money to work in that opportunity and so we, we see that as an opportunity at the moment but um, still we're very comfortable owning uh, the majority of the portfolio and some of these very stable durable businesses uh, and it also provides nice liquidity for the portfolio so there's no Capacity issues we have in terms of trading liquidity, um, you know, we're easily able to convert and create, and redeem, et cetera. Um, and so that's not a hindrance in terms of investors looking for liquidity for our overall fund. And um, so that's by design. And again, I, I want to be limited at this moment, 40 companies, you know, there's 4,000 banks out there. Uh, and so, you know, there's opportunity to be, you know, much bigger, but I still think you can do more with less uh, and pick some, you know, the, the elite of the institutions. Uh, you know, like a WR Berkeley that's, that's shown uh, the ability to do better than the overall market over time. I think maybe when people think about financial services, they go back to the financial crisis and they think about the degree to which, you know, correlations went to one and anything that had financial services uh, exposure was hurt disproportionately. I'm interested in how you think about the cyclicality of the you know the companies you own especially given the bank weighting you know relative to maybe a more diversified portfolio that had you know healthcare and software and things that might be a little bit less economically sensitive right that's a that's a great point and there's a couple of pieces that i think what might be relevant today uh is certainly the financial crisis was pretty incredible at that time and you know we we, we know that stocks all went down and uh, but a lot of you know, good things have come for that, you know, in terms of the banks and regulations and capitalizations and so on. And so we're kind of in a different spot today. But you know, on a parallel example, you know, there's a lot of debate about rates today. Are they going up, down, sideways? 
and as we know, uh, rates impact financials uh, quite a bit in terms of their business plans, and it also impacts financials differently. Uh, so for an insurance company, for instance, you know, higher rates enable them to invest more of their 85% of their float at higher, more stable returns, and they're constrained to some extent uh, of where they can invest. And so to the extent that rates are higher uh, and that reflect higher inflation, that helps the premium. And so to some extent, uh, insurance companies benefit in a higher rate environment, right? As opposed to some of the dynamics that have occurred with the banks in terms of rising deposit costs. And on average, you know, over time, uh, higher rates are good for banks, but because we've had this rapid rise in deposit costs, you know, we've seen some of the issues in terms of the funding mix, uh, you know, not adjusting or adjusting quicker than the long-term loan base, et cetera. And so that's been a, a headwind. But um, so when we think about kind of the rate component, you know, we look at the portfolio, where's the sensitivity there? We're not actually picking an outlook for rates. We don't do any of the macro. We build it up bottom ups up. Um, but that's, that's a component we think about today. And, you know, obviously recessions and uh, unemployment, you know, that's a, a big impact to consumer and, you know, the metrics that drive a lot of our companies. One thing I will say, though, is a firm like America Express, and you know, when we went in this pandemic, there was a firm that uh, went and accelerated uh, their marketing spend. So their margins compressed uh, as they went to service more clients, and it gave them a nice tailwind coming out of the pandemic to reap the benefits of additional growth and engagement in terms of client acquisition cards, et cetera. And so there's a company you know, an incredible company over time, certainly leveraged to kind of financial conditions, but also able to ad uh, to change their business model, to adjust it uh, for uh, those changing opportunities and actually use a little distress uh, to their advantage. And so I think that's another thing we look for in these companies. Uh, not only should they be good in terms of being able to deal with recessions and uh, more issues with credit, but how they can accelerate growth and improve their competitive position afterwards. And sticking on the banks, another theme you highlight is how technology is transforming the traditional banking business. In a lot of cases, banks may be ripe for disruption from new entrants. Um, how do you go about trying to figure out who the winners and losers are going to be in the banking industry? Right, that's a that's a great question. I would just say going back to 30,000 feet, I really do believe that we are on another wave of technology uplift uh, and efficiency. And if you think about financial services, they have a lot of the components that we very well levered to benefit from that. So huge uh, client bases, uh, fixed platforms in terms of technology, and then tremendous amounts of data, right, which can be used for risk management, bespoke offerings, uh, tailoring, et cetera. And so they automatically are well positioned to take advantage of what I believe will be this technology uplift. Uh, and, and so if you are interested in that, yes, you can play the AI game and all this, this high multiple tech companies, et cetera, or you can think about it in terms of how it would affect my industry, uh, and the firms that are, that are participating. And if you think about America Express or JP Morgan, for instance, they're going to spend $7 billion this year or last year, 2023 on technology. So there's a company that's already embraced it. Uh, if you interact with any of their products, you know how good their apps are, their platform, et cetera. So they've already been engrossed in it and, and are on this wave to spending and, and efficiency. Uh, and so there's a company that we think will be a clear winner. They have the culture to execute on it. They are, they have the capital to embrace that spending uh, and they are able to deal with that data. Um, I will say the one constraining factor you know, to think about with our space is kind of regulation, right? To the extent that all these companies want to just go crazy and automate everything, you know, they can only do that to the extent that the regulations are with them on that process. So we, we can't just simply eliminate all the human interaction uh, potentially until, you know, the regulators have confidence uh, in that risk management, the change of systems and, and procedures, et cetera. So that, that will be somewhat of a gating factor going forward. But again, these are institutions uh, that are very well levered to this and with their fixed bases, uh, you know, I see nothing but potential improvement, uh, and also being, uh, helped by the deflationary aspects of technology going forward. Do you see the benefits of technology mainly being from a cost saving perspective, or is there an element that some of the companies you're invested in also have the ability to use technology to gain share? within whatever industry that they're focused on? 
No, I think that's right. Uh, um, uh, there are a number of factors that will go into that. Uh, I think on the on the cost side, you know, you can obviously see the impacts of automation, uh, cloud, et cetera. We've already seen that today. Uh, better client service, you know, reduction of some of those costs, et cetera. Uh, and then on the engagement side, you know, how you offer value proposition to holders of the platinum card, for instance. You know, the apps are so important. And I think the leaders uh, will continue to take share uh, as they reduce friction for clients. And to the extent that they can customize advice, customize solutions even further through this use of big data and, and crunching that, I think you'll see uh, a movement and acceleration to some of those providers. And, uh, you know, again, uh, you've just seen how the big tech firms, you know, whether it's Apple, et cetera, you know, th- by making that platforms uh, so seamless and engaging, uh, it can really mean great share for them. And I, I, the companies we own are, are very well ever to that. And when I look at your bank holdings, as we've already mentioned, I see a focus on larger institutions such as Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan, as opposed to the smaller regional players. Um, I get that there's a large cap bias um, here to, in you know kind of in the way that the portfolio is structured. But I'm curious about why why the big money center banks versus the maybe even regionals or even kind of like smaller community banks. So. Obviously, it's a pretty pretty dynamic space over the last couple of years. Uh, went through the Silicon Valley signature last uh, spring, um, so you know it's it's been a pretty amazing period. Uh, we were able to avoid some of those uh, banks. We did own a you know a little uh, First Republic at, at one point, um, but you know we moved out of that. And we, we saw some of that coming, and and we were luckily able to avoid it, and also to benefit from one of our bigger holdings, as First Citizens, and. Uh, they were able to buy that bank, you know, with a two billion, a ten billion dollar accretion from the, you know, the consolidation of Silicon Valley. So that was a good catalyst last year. Uh, in general, we've been talking over the last year and a half since we've been running this fund, an appreciation for the bigger platform, and uh, you know, there's a couple of fundamental reasons for that. First, uh, they have more diversified revenue streams. So if you think about Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, you know, they have asset wealth management. Uh, capital markets, traditional banking, card services, custody, et cetera. And so you're not beholden simply to the yield curve, although that uh, makes a difference. Uh, they've also, as we've come through this crisis, been able to manage their funding costs much more competitively. And if you think about Wells Fargo, uh, their cost of uh, deposits last quarter was 1.58%, uh, whereas some of the regional banks or even the New York, the New York Community Bank, for instance, way over 3%. And so uh, there has been a natural benefit to having that scale, uh, the operational diversity, et cetera. Uh, and so that's been a benefit. And then the last thing is, are, are two other things that they're certainly very well capitalized from our perspective at this point, diversified, uh, as opposed to where we see a little uh, less capitalization in terms of the, uh, the smaller banks um, and, and diversified it to uh, CRE as well. Uh, but we also see uh, some leverage to improving capital markets, and that's a big catalyst for us this year. And so Merrill Lynch at, at Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, uh, Morgan Stanley, et cetera. So we look for more vibrant capital markets to be a catalyst for growth this year. And and so I guess at this point, we could decide to think about um, buying those smaller regionals. I mean, you certainly have the discount and valuation in terms of tangible book, uh, but we, we just don't like the fact that the yield curve is still inverted and, and the pressure that's going to occur. Uh, we also see an unwinding of the CRE being a potential issue. And then, you know, as these rate cuts take a little more affirmative action, uh, you know, a higher unemployment could impact them. So I think our opportunity set is better with the bigger banks. There's a couple catalysts in place uh, and good visibility in terms of their earnings growth this year. If I look at the two big to fail banks, I kind of see them like regulated utilities and that they are not going to fail but their ROEs are capped by all the regulations and the capital requirements. Is that a fair assessment or um, is there something more dynamic uh, going on in these big institutions that might not be visible for people who don't focus on this all the time? Well, you know, after the financial crisis, you know, the banks were, were significantly recapitalized as, you know, through the higher, more onerous capital requirements cleaner balance sheets, et cetera. And, you know, that has certainly impacted ROE potential going forward. Uh, But I think there is a benefit to being better capitalized in terms of 
uh, operational stability and appreciation. And to the extent that that's happened, uh, these some of these banks deserve higher multiples, in my opinion. And yes, they're going to return less, uh, but they're safer. So I think that's a good thing that came out of the financial crisis. And, you know, again, we, we own just a few stocks uh, in our portfolio, 40 right now, and a few banks. And if you think about JP Morgan, over time, the ROE has been 15%. Last year was 18%. Um, so if you cager at 18%, you're going to double your money every four years. Uh, so I would take that return any day. And that's, you know, kind of this new environment that we're in. Uh, so they've really be- managed their businesses very well, uh, you know, investing in areas of higher REs, faster growth, et cetera, uh, and just been real, you know, beneficial in terms of, uh, you know, the capital returns. So you've beaten the market over time with JP Morgan in this space, uh, and I believe you'll continue to do very well there. And I, I wouldn't be unhappy with, you know, 18% return, they're probably over earning, but 15% over time, that's a pretty incredible. And we can't leave a discussion uh, regarding banks without talking about credit. Credit has not really been an issue for the banks for a while. From my point of view, it's hard to imagine that we're not going to see a credit cycle over the next few years. What are your thoughts on that? And how would you say your banks are positioned for, uh, you know, for some kind of credit cycle? Yeah, you know, this is, it's always cyclical, um, although the pandemic has created some distortions around that. You know, we have the Fed raising policy and, uh, you know, some interesting dynamics with related, you know, with the kind of the fixed base of America having, uh, you know, low mortgages at this point, uh, you know, and, and the stability there. So, uh, and then we've had, you know, just very good employment coming out of this. And I think that's benefited. And we've heard that from a lot of the institutions. But my perspective you know, we had incredible credit metrics coming through the pandemic prior to that, and we'll get a normalization, right? And so we've seen that from Bank of America. We've seen that from these other firms. And, you know, and, and most recently, the credit card companies have kind of gotten to their normal reserves uh, pre-pandemic uh, now. Now, the, the market tends to be a little hysterical sometimes. And so from my perspective, I see a normalization to longer-term trends, whether it's in card, um, home loans, and setting, uh, mortgages, et cetera. Uh, and so I think that will normalize and we'll get to a normal level there and uh, that will be incorporated. So nothing to get excited about there. Uh, on the contrary, you know, I think a big issue that we've all talked about and, and more recently with New York Community Bank is this kind of pockets of CRE. You know, a lot of these um, single family homes, office buildings were financed at very low rates a few years ago. Um, there's been some dynamics with occupancy, certainly at the office buildings. And so there's going to be some changes there and that needs to be worked out in the system. And so there will be some pockets of kind of headline CRE issues and, and so on. And, but that will be worked out over time. I think the banks are, you know, the large banks that I own are well reserved for that. Um, but there'll certainly be some pockets uh, of issues. And, you know, we've, we've gotten some distress from New York Community Bank. Uh, but ag- again, I think that will be more idiosyncratic than overall. Um, but absent any major shocks, I think the U.S. economy will come back to kind of normalize, you know, slower growth, uh, good metrics. Uh, and, you know, do very fine with um, the institutions that we own. I want to switch gears and, and you know, talk about another um, aspect of your portfolio. We had Craig Packer, who is now the co-president and head of credit at Blue Owl on the podcast. And he talked a lot about how the alternative asset managers have stepped in to finance a lot of companies that banks traditionally worked with, but don't work with as much as they used to. I see Blue Owl as a holding of yours. How does a company like Blue Owl fit within the major themes you focus on? So we we really like Blue Owl for a number of reasons. Uh, and when you think about their um, set of businesses, so they have three major businesses that are run by entrepreneurial leaders uh, with very good leading characteristics in terms of potential for growth um, and demonstrated growth. So the first is the GP Stakes business, which is the old Dial Partners. Uh, and with that, you get to own uh, a stake in, say, Silver Lake, which has been one of the most successful tech investing firms. Uh, and there, so by owning Blue Owl, you're essentially owning a, a piece of Silver Lake and all of those companies that they've invested over time. So that's a that's a great business. They built scale there. Lots of opportunity in, in firms going forward. Their second business is the private credit business. Uh, again, that's grown very well and levered to the dynamics that uh, I, I think the previous speaker you had mentioned talked about. And so this is opportunity where uh, private capital run by firms like Blue Owl stepping in 
where banks are pulling away and, and providing a solution at very desirable rates uh, and, and underwriting. And so I think that is a dynamic that will play out over time. And, and given the, the actual capital base of Blue Owl, the, the ability to take share there is pretty tremendous, as well as reward shareholders in terms of growth for us. And then the last business they have is this real estate business, which is uniquely positioned. Uh, they provide uh, it's, it's, you know, a complex strategy, but it's simple to understand. And I think, as we mentioned, some of the troubles in CRE, a demand for their services and the type of investing will will be very strong. And we've seen good flows there. So when you put it all together, you know, a very smart entrepreneurial firm, they've done a great job growing it, nice payouts, decent valuation, uh, and very good execution. Private credit is probably, you know, I don't know if there's a hotter, you know, asset class within domestic markets and private credit and feels like there's a lot of capital flowing into it. Um, everybody and anybody's trying to raise a private credit fund to take advantage of that. How do you see Blue Owl being positioned, you know, given that so many other firms, um, you know, even the larger, um, you know, alternative asset managers have these gigantic uh, private credit platforms in addition to everybody who, who can raise in capital to, to compete in that space? Well, I think there's some lessons akin to the venture capital business. Uh, in that, you know, I, I think you and I could just go start a venture capital business tomorrow. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean we'll be successful or, you know, be, provide risk-adjusted returns to our shareholders. Uh, and, you know, even though there's an incredible landscape now for what seems to be the shift in, in bank funding uh, to private credit, that doesn't mean that uh, we should be aligned with, with certain institutions and, and may not be able to execute on. So, again, I like the asset management business, easy barriers to entry, very difficult uh, to execute in terms of being successful. And what takes success in this uh, environment? And the underwriting is, is, the, is the basic component of this. And, and, you know, if you take a firm like Apollo, um, they have a history of underwriting 20, you know, 2,400 people that you know, are working to source deals, to work with companies, and to put all this together. And then you have an incredible expertise behind it uh, many, many years of understanding credit cycles uh, in terms of that underwriting. So there's a, they have scale, they have a platform, they have capital and understanding to execute in this environment. Uh, Blue Owl, uh, certainly uh, the same way. Uh, but, you know, to the extent that there are, uh, you know, mimic shops that want to do this, I, I just don't think uh, they will be as successful or uh, could be more dangerous for investors. I mean, this is not that easy to do. Uh, and again, I think the re returns um, you know, will be very differentiated between those major firms that really understand what's going on and the firms that are sort of jumping into the process because they see the flow trend. Uh, so I, I think you have to be very careful there. And, and, you know, to the extent that, you know, some of these asset flows are into leveraged loans uh, for certain companies, you know, there's a reason the banks are pulling back from that. Um, mm -hmm. The opportunity set may be more difficult there. And, and so just because you have capital and a great story, that, that doesn't necessarily mean uh, you're going to make money. But, you know, again, like Apollo, we own KKR, Blue Owl. I mean, these businesses uh, are very, very well positioned to take advantage of this. An incredible trend, I believe. Our sponsor for this show is Santangel's Roundtable Cap Intro Events, founded by my good friend, Steve Friedman. What's a Santangel? It's actually a who. Luis de Santangel was the man who persuaded the Spanish monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, to finance the voyage of Christopher Columbus, one of the greatest investment decisions in history. Originally a newsletter that published profiles of small, undiscovered fund managers in incredible detail, Santangels made a well-executed pivot in 2012 to the conference business, including its roundtable cap intro events. After 12 years and 23 events, the Santangels roundtable is expanding in 2024, adding a third event at Boston's Fenway Park to accompany its usual two roundtables held in New York. Like a traditional cap intro event, the Santangels Roundtables are free for allocators to attend, include one-on-one -on -one meetings with managers, and offer opportunities to network among allocators and managers. It's no surprise, then, that the Roundtable attracts the most serious allocators in the world, including many of the top endowments, foundations, and family offices who rarely come together in one room. So I encourage you to visit Santangels' website, www.santangelsreview.com, to learn more and request an invitation. And you mentioned when we first started that the wealth creation and the household balance sheets that have, uh, you know, that have built over the last 30 or 40 years should be beneficial to the payments industry. And that space was pretty hot for a long time. feels like some of the excitement has died down. 
there are a lot of different players in the ecosystem and, and ways to play the trends and payments. Where have you chosen to focus? Well, that sector certainly had a, a banner year last year. Uh, you know, again, there's a lot of disruption there, a lot of excitement, and, and, and it's a wonderful space to see that. You know, we certainly have had uh, terrific momentum from Visa, MasterCard, et cetera. You know, but they, they traded pretty hard multiples, as we know. Uh, so great businesses, but I wouldn't necessarily uh, be undiscovered in terms of their potential. Uh, again, I would come back to an America Express. Uh, there's a company, 30% ROEs. You're growing top line at 10% uh, versus kind of the industry at 8%. You know, bottom line, 15% EPS growth, fairly consistent, great outlook there. Uh, it's trading at a 15 multiple. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I think a nice discount to what, you know, that growth in earnings, nice discount to the overall market. Uh, and you have an incredible uh, management team there, just executed well, great uh, client base. Uh, and so I, I think make it easy on yourself. Uh, go with the leader in the space uh, and, and a firm that over time has shown you the ability to, to execute well. And you can't argue with those ROEs and the platform. It's just it's an incredible compounding machine. And the interesting news, I guess, in the last week, in the payment space is the proposed merger between Capital One and Discover. Curious, you know, given your financial experience, you know, what your thoughts are on on that that transaction and potential competitive threats to any, you know, to 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 American Express, given you know that Discover owns its own payment network. Well, a couple of takeaways from from that news, and that was pretty big news for the space. I mean, given the the size of that deal. I think number one, uh, the fact that you know Capital One appreciates the closed loop business at Discover highlights uh, you know the power of American Express's platform. Uh, and number two, the idea that you need to continue to scale the business to get synergies, global reach, uh, benefits to your clients, et cetera. So that's well ingrained, and so that that benefits the you know the bigger scale players, which we appreciate. And again, Richard Fairbank, this this is the CEO of Capital One. We own a little bit. Uh, we should own more. Uh, he's been a visionary in the space. He's done incredible things in, in terms of being innovative, reaching an incredible segment, uh, and just driving results there. Uh, and, you know, with this deal, it seems very opportunistic. Uh, I think that, you know, Discover's had some challenges over the last couple months, years, et cetera. And so uh, this makes a lot of sense for both of them, I believe, at this point. Uh, and again, it'll make them more formidable. But, you know, I'm not too concerned about uh, America Express's position. Uh, it, it, you know, in the overall market, you know, again, you know, plenty of room to operate in terms of growing the overall TAM, share globally, et cetera. Um, so I, it was a good deal for them. I wish we owned more, uh, but I, I think it's just another indication of, you know, how desirable the payment space is. And we've talked a little bit about Berkshire, and I know it's one of your largest holdings. It's a stock I own as well. But Charlie Munger's passing reminds us all that there's going to come a time when Buffett is not in our lives either. When people ask you about why you own Berkshire, what do you tell them about what the company looks like when someone else is in charge? So we've talked about scale and payments, but let's talk about scale at Berkshire. Uh, the firm was generating $800 million per week of operating earnings in the third quarter. That's pretty awesome. So that money needs to be allocated. In the fourth quarter, I believe they did about $35 billion of gains in their $320 billion portfolio. And then at the end of the third quarter, they had $150 billion of cash. Uh, and so you have an enormous uh, capital opportunity and optionality just in their overall balance sheet. And as we know, these guys have been very good in terms of putting capital uh, out there in the market. And, and one could argue that uh, you know, it's an even more dynamic situation going forward uh, for opportunity set. But, hey, if they don't do that, you know, they've shown the ability to buy back shares and, and appreciate their own firm as well. I would just say uh, it was probably inevitable that Charlie Munger was going to pass away at 99. Uh, he was still running marathons in terms of uh, intellectual exercises, even up to his death, giving interviews. So it was just an amazing person. Uh, but, again, Buffett is not – built this business by himself. I mean, he has an incredible corporate culture in terms of the CEOs and the businesses he's acquired. And then also at the corporate level, uh, you know, kind of in the house, you know, he's, he's assembled a, a team of incredible people. And I would just say, you know, it's been 
a slow process in terms of rolling out those managers. Greg Abel has been more visible. Uh, we've seen him over the last couple of years. But, I, I mean, from my perspective, I think he might be the best operational leader they've had there. So um, to the extent that we lose Munger and his cultural impact, I mean, obviously an incredible loss. Uh, but, you know, the uh, – um, the ability for Greg to now come up and rise and run the business, I think, is a huge benefit uh, to the organization in terms of accountability uh, and uh, returns. And so I, I'm very comfortable. I think that the corporate culture and what Buffett has put in place in terms of the operating benefits of the conglomerate, the tax synergies, uh, the capital allocation, et cetera, and just those sheer numbers of cash flow. Uh, we'll position this firm for, for many decades. And so I'm not too worried. I am a little worried about the humor content at the annual meeting, uh, losing one of our, uh, uh, you know, great people on that front. Uh, but again, I think the messages and the lessons will uh, still be very prominent and, and worth a lot of time to, uh, to go out there for. And you mentioned culture and the special Berkshire culture, a topic you highlight in your letters is partnering with companies with winning cultures what are the elements of a winning culture you look for? So I think we could talk about this for hours. Um, I, you know, a couple of examples, uh, and, I, you know, there's been lots of books written about this. Uh, a couple of things I look for uh, when I first look at a company, for instance, um, I, I try to look at a sample of the employees, not just the CEO, because you usually meet him at IR, et cetera. But you just go down, you know, if you're able to interact with kind of the service organizations and one of the few things I do is, you know, I'll call up the, if I call a call center at America Express, for instance, because I'm a card holder, you know, I'll ask the rep, do you know who the CEO is? What's his name? Uh, and invariably, I get, you know, the same answer, Steve Squarey, of course. Uh, and so there's one firm where I feel like in all of the employees that I've ever interact with uh, have a good understanding of the mission of the company, the value proposition for clients in uh, driving shareholder returns. And sure, all of these employees are, are shareholders, so they monitor their uh, stock re rewards and the returns over time. But again, for a corporate culture to succeed, you need, just like a football team, everybody to be working together to understand the mission, to be efficient, uh, and great corporate communication. And when you get that out of an institution the size of America Express and the communication, that gives me a lot of confidence. Uh, so that's one example where uh, I think that's very important in terms of a winning culture. W.R. Berkeley, we've talked about before, you know, over time they've allocated capital, uh, you know, and it's a very simple business. They execute very well. And again, the message is very congruent uh, um, over time. And you read the annual reports, very consistent uh, and how they approach things. And so there, to me, that's a huge winning culture that they've reinforced for a long time and it's driven results. Uh, and again, uh, those are kind of some of the examples I think about. Uh, and I, I love to read the books. You know, I went to grad school uh, and learned about this stuff. And actually, the most interesting thing I've listened to recently was the Tom Brady interview on his approach to success and how he got there from Michigan and, and the high school and his approach to succeeding in, in kind of an entrepreneurial mindset. You know, it was football, but you can apply a lot of those lessons to you know, sourcing firms and, and being successful in terms of partnering with those equities. Something that just occurred to me is that you know, you're investing in these gigantic organizations with these massive balance sheets, you know, the ability to have any really granular understanding of like what's being underwritten and like, you know, securities they own. I mean, you just like th these companies have gotten so big that it's like whatever analysis you might be able to have done like 20 or 30 years ago, it's just done because of the, because of the size and scale. How, how do you approach, how has your research approach changed as the, these companies that you invest in have just gotten so large and so diversified um, where you just, you, you really just, it, it, there's, if you ever could have confidence that there was like, you know, that there was nothing scary hiding in the numbers, it's really hard to do that now. Right. So, I mean, trying to understand the reinsurance and pressure pathway is impossible. Um, and again, understanding winning cultures is a big part of investing in firms like insurance, also in banking, because you're really reliant on those cultures to invest that capital wisely. Uh, and there are times when you want to pull back and writing premium. It doesn't make sense on the return Alex, even though it may hurt the growth. Uh, and if you, you've seen that over time with WR Berkeley, 
Uh, and you see that in the insurance business quite a bit. So the, the very good compounders insurance uh, have the ability to pull back uh, and restrain themselves when they should, and also to accelerate when they see opportunity and to understand that rather than being determined by next quarterly earnings or fulfilling a growth rate. So again, it, it is really a faith business. It is a confidence business uh, in understanding uh, that intellectual capacity at those different firms. And you need to have a really good uh, history of their execution uh, to get that confidence, right? And, you know, and we've seen that. And there's a lot of insurance companies we've seen over time and they're like, wow, they're growing really quickly. Uh, they seem to be very innovative. And then all of a sudden they have a quarter where their reserves just go through the roof and you're like, whoa, what just happened there? And uh, again, they miss the cyclicality. They don't quite understand the landscape. And so you have to be very careful. On the flip side, the firms that seem to execute well on that, especially within those businesses, banking, insurance, do very well. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, J.P. Morgan, in terms of the underwriting, you know, if you look at the capacity of those major balance sheets today, Wells Fargo at this point, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, there's a lot of capacity now to, to facilitate loan growth uh, and in, in a more opportune situation where you see much of the banking world at the smaller and regional level pulling back from uh, that because they have to deal with their own capital issues, et cetera. Uh, and so, uh, again, I... I I can't argue that I know what's going on in the, the annual report of the reinsurance business at Berkshire Hathaway, but I have great faith uh, that those guys will continue to do the smart things. And, you know, as we analyze New York Community Banks, which we don't own in the portfolio, but their 10Q uh, last quarter was 88 pages. They have $100 billion of consolidated assets from three major acquisitions. Uh, a portfolio uh, of apartments in New York. And so getting granularity on, on understanding that whole portfolio, just, it's, not, it's not possible. Uh, so you must, must have that confidence. And so there's an extreme example where, you know, they sort of surprised you in the last call and you're now, okay, what's really going on? And, you know, uh, what are the incentives? What are the issues that could come up? Uh, but again, as you highlight, you, you have to have faith in these businesses. And if you do, uh, you'll be well rewarded. And when you guys were launching this strategy, you had a choice between traditional mutual fund and an active ETF. So I'm curious why you chose the active ETF and what you think the benefit to clients, the benefits to clients are of an active ETF maybe versus a traditional mutual fund. So a couple of points on that perspective. I think with our management approach here at Gabelli, it's very consistent, bottoms up, fundamental value. Uh, we look for catalysts to narrow that value, uh, and we practice that every day. So in terms of the, our approach to managing those sets of funds, no different. Uh, and we've, we've launched this fund with a specific mandate, et cetera. So that, that's it's up. We've been attracted to the ETF business for, for many years. We launched our first one in, in 2021. And obviously, many years ago, we saw how the beta offerings, BlackRock, State Street, et cetera, that has taken tremendous share. And, and what's happened there? You have the benefits of tax efficiency, lower costs, uh, real-time trading. And those are all uh, uh, appreciative by investors. And so we, we've seen that beta demand. Uh, and as an active management shop, we've been interested in these vehicles for those tax benefits. We've always been tax sensitive here, buy and hold, et cetera. Uh, but we've wanted to be entrance into this field, uh, but also not get away from our culture of active management. And that's why we launched our fund, the, the active. Um, and so we have a kind of a unique ETF, same transparency in terms of liquidity, et cetera, tax benefits, no different there. Uh, and so I, I would just say on a whole, we see that. Now, if you go back up to 30,000 feet as an industry, we've seen share go from uh, active mutual funds to beta. But more recently, uh, and I will highlight the fourth quarter of this year, this new boom of active funds. So we've been very, seen a lot of success. And so this is the second nature of ETF. And so we think we're very well positioned to capture share. Uh, and we also saw in the fourth quarter, not only uh, you know, higher growth rates for active funds, but active launches actually eclipse beta offerings and index, et cetera. Uh, and so uh, we just think there's a, an incredible inflection point of demand in the marketplace. You obviously need track records to prove your investment thesis. We think we, you know, as a firm, we've been around that gives us confidence uh, in what we're offering. Uh, and so we think, it, it, personally, I'm very excited for this potential. 
to be, you know, kind of a, a transparent wave and also to meet investor demand. Uh, and, and again, we're the only uh, active, or we're one of two active ETFs in the space. Uh, so you click. And then I would also highlight one other thing. If you think about financial services data, last year we had some major bank institutions blow up, Silicon Valley, Signature, First Republic, right? So those went to zero. So if you own the beta index, some of your holdings went to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, and when financial services, you know, we've known about bank failures over time, we've had some insurance blow ups, et cetera. They're leveraged institutions and there's, there's potentially challenges. Because we are an active, we can actually add credit as a component of our research. So we invest in JP Morgan, we feel comfortable in their capitalization and their viability. That is a differentiating factor with active financial services fund as opposed to beta, uh, where last year you had those blow ups. So that's a nice component in terms of differentiation uh, in terms of where we are today. And I think it's pretty relevant as we start to go through a process of more challenging potential times for smaller regional banks. I always like to ask portfolio managers about a mistake they made that was so painful that it still impacts the way they invest today. What comes to your mind when I ask that? So I, like everybody else, have, have a lot of bad trades uh, and, you know, certainly reflect on it. I have a book that I've written those up and uh, I, I've hopefully gotten better over time in terms of lessons learned. But I wanted to sort of think about this question in a different way. Uh, and this was uh, kind of an anecdote that I constantly think about. When I first joined this firm, I was a young analyst, business school, and I was tasked to go visit this company. And again, I, you know, being out of business school, you know, sort of very young, naive. And I met with the CEO and IR of a firm in New York City. Uh, and we had some connections to them. And they, their business was around buying out life insurance policies from elderly people. Uh, and again, they would show up. They say, look, we'll cash you out. Um, and we'll take a bet, a bet on your, uh, and how long you live. Uh, and I spent 45 minutes with the interview. I walked out of there and I was like, my goodness. This is a firm I don't want to ever own. I, and I, I, it's the first thing I was like, you know, there's bad investments. There's not great investments. This thing I was like, I don't want to make sure that our firm did not own anymore. I came right back to Rye, got on the train. I looked up the holdings. There was a couple of portfolio managers in small positions to blow this out. This is, this is crazy. You do not want to be in this business. Uh, and ironically, uh, I did get some interesting looks, but ironically, three weeks later, the FBI raided this institution. Uh, and I uh, shut them down for bad practices and bad business. Uh, and so it, it sticks in my head in terms of uh, if you have a bad feeling in terms of a gut feeling about a company, don't hesitate to just write it off, uh, you know. Uh, and so that, that gives me confidence in terms of gut. You know, we spend a lot of time on metrics, you know, inside research, et cetera. It takes us a long time to build a thesis to invest. But if there's just a tingling or a bad understanding of something, it's easy to just write it off. I assume that's relatively rare relative to, you know, other things that go wrong in an investment. So maybe you, you know, to, to uh, compound on that last response, what does your sell discipline look like? Why are you typically selling these great businesses that you've identified? Right. Uh, that's, that's really difficult. I mean, I, I have no problem buying and, and we would love to hold businesses uh, forever. Uh, but again, we're, as a portfolio manager, we're always optimizing uh, the the potential uh, you know price to value that we see and maximizing that. So if we say a better opportunity for certain stocks, then um, we will reduce and, and allocate. Um, the good part is our our turnover has been relatively low uh, over the last uh, you know component of the last two years in, in inception. Uh, so we we've been we've been fortunate to to build up. Um, uh, these positions, we've had inflows, so that allows us to kind of allocate differently uh, along the way. Uh, so, but, you know, to the extent where we smell something, I mean, obviously that was a rare example there uh, that I highlight, but, you know, to the extent that we see execution or something we don't like in the balance sheet in terms of development, uh, we have no issue uh, blowing it out. Uh, but again, it, it, it's, it's an ongoing art in terms of balancing the opportunity set, our valuation parameters, uh, and also the catalyst that we see in place to to benefit from that. You also, you know, in that response, highlighted the importance of trying to understand people and like trying to figure out if the people are, you know, crooked or 
or as, as we used to like, like to joke, stealing for you or from you. I'm interested, given that you you focus on culture and you invest in a lot of these black boxes of sorts where you just can't really get granularity into what's going on um, in the loan book or in a reinsurance portfolio, what kind of characteristics of management do you look for as you're assessing whether you want to partner with a company? I think it ultimately comes down, to, you know, in terms of the balance sheets, capital allocation. And, you know, the, I would say the, the overwhelming thing that, you know, a check I do is, again, the ability for an ego, somebody in charge to say, we don't want to underwrite. We don't feel pressure to do that. And every, every CEO wants to continue to build their business and, you know, grow to the sky and do well. But I think that if you look at the successful managers in terms of capital allocation over time, they've done a very good job of backing off when the returns were not good and then accelerating when they were. And if you don't have a culture, a board, et cetera, that reinforces uh, that and, and you have a history of that, then that's not what I want to be involved with. Uh, and so that's, that's a, it's a rare skill. It really is. Uh, and you see it all the time. So if you look at the beta uh, of, or the mean of firms over time, you know, they just have a specific, we want to grow premium 4%. We want to do uh, It's very rare um, that you have uh, a CEO that says, you know what, we're not going to grow right now. We're going to disappoint uh, those analyst expectations because we don't see the opportunity for uh, returns. And uh, again, Buffett many years ago was pressed when rates were zero. He was holding on all those treasuries and he didn't. He had the fortitude to say, you know what, uh, we're going to find better returns on our capital. We won't be forced into doing that. And, you know, here he is investing in short-term treasuries at five and a quarter. And some of the bank CEOs uh, many years ago, you know, um, saw, you know, we were getting into trouble today. Because a lot of them over this very low rate environment were investing in, in mortgages at two and a half percent. And so they're locked into kind of these lower yields going forward. It's impaired them in terms of their earnings uh, as opposed to being more liquid. So I, I think that's an important aspect of capital allocation, balance sheets. But again, if you're able to find that, understand that skill, you will be well rewarded because they're the haves, uh, really make a generous return and the have nots. Uh, just seem to flounder. And I'd love to just sneak in a quick question about valuation. If I think about financial, specifically banks, insurance, you know, you don't really have that many levers, right? You've got um, price to book, price to tangible, price to earnings. I'm interested if, do you guys, you know, do you guys adjust earnings or book value for for changes of any kind to like create your own proprietary valuation metrics? Do you, I'm just trying to get a sense of how you approach valuing these companies and you kind of get assessing intrinsic value across these industries where you don't, you know, you don't have a DCF, you don't have EV, EV to EBITDA, some other metrics that people use. I think, um, yeah, we have detailed models and, and we get into the some of those components and we use the traditional metrics, et cetera, at a high level, but there are also things that we look at for nuances. We look at the composition of where they're investing. So are they loaded up on CRE today or have they been smarter about where they're allocating capital? Uh, and then also, I think one of the most competitive aspects for banks uh, is that cost of funding. And that ultimately drives, you know, the NIM over time, the ability to loan, the ability to generate uh, returns for shareholders. Uh, capital returns, et cetera. So if there is a component, um, a competitive advantage, you'll see that in the cost of funding. And so I mentioned Wells Fargo, JP Morgan, Bank of America. Uh, and so their businesses are set up just much differently uh, than the smaller regionals. Now, where um, understanding the bigger part of the balance sheet came into uh, focus was a couple of quarters ago um, when we started to realize a lot of banks had you know, these held to maturity securities. Right. And the accounting for the big banks is different than the smaller banks and, and the impact. So uh, a firm like uh, Bank of America uh, had a huge uh, book of HDM securities, over 600 billion. And so you really needed to include the mark to market of those losses uh, in, in really an adjusted book value and understand where they were on a capital basis. And, and so that we we did that um, and we need to get comfortable uh, with the opportunity. So. When you thought about that as a price to tangible book, it was actually much lower because you had the huge embedded losses for HTM, 
will they realize them over time? It remains to be seen. We'll see how the rate pitcher and, and, and the runoff uh, continue. Uh, but, but that was an important metric, as you say, to do that. Um, and then the last thing is you know, more specific was Charles Schwab. They had a similar issue uh, in terms of liquidity. And so these banks are, you know, they are confidence meters in terms of their deposits. And to the extent that you don't understand their capital levels, uh, you don't understand the liquidity, uh, you could face a situation like Silicon Valley, Signature Bank, uh, et cetera, very quickly. Uh, so, you know, you, you, you need to do more than just price the book. You need to understand the composition of where they're investing, what are their rates, and uh, what are their returns. Uh, and, and again, what are their customer relations and, and the dynamics there? So you're a couple of years into um, running this active ETF. I'm curious if we're having this conversation again in seven years, what success would look like to you in this strategy? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, well, first of all, I, I think it's an incredible experience just to come here every day to be able to perform for shareholders, uh, meet great companies. This is an incredible job. I just love this field. Um, I, I knew very early on that I wanted to do this. I used to get the uh, newspaper clippings from my dad and monitor the different stocks. And so, again, it, it, for me, it's an incredible uh, thing to be involved with. Uh, but going forward, I have a mandate. I've set out what I want to do. We've laid this out. Uh, and so we want to beat the market. We want to build wealth for our shareholders uh, and be competitive with other offerings. Uh, and that's another aspect. You know, I'm, I'm competing like everybody else out there as well. And I want to do the best I can for shareholders. And hopefully for some shareholders that we, that we have, it, you know, our business over the next seven years will mean material gains um, to their net worth. And, and that means a lot to me. Uh, one of the great things about ETFs in general is the democratization of uh, clients. And so to the extent that I had a high school buddy uh, when he, when I first started the fund and he wrote to me, he said, you know, I, I don't have much money, but I could, I could buy a hundred shares of, of, of the fund. Uh, you know, that was easy access for him. So uh, you know, we, we did very well last year. We we're up almost 40%. So, you know, if, if we continue to, um, generate returns and do a great job, you know, this will, this could have a material impact on people. And I think that's what would be most exciting for me. We'll close with the question we ask all of our manager guests. What is the most underappreciated aspect of the investment opportunity in front of the Gabelli, uh, sorry, the Gabelli Financial Services Opportunity Fund today? So we've talked about a couple of themes, um, but and I've been in the marketplace for a long time. And I remember uh, many years ago when the first beta offering started coming, the SPY. Uh, and, you know, it, it has grown, uh, even the XLF, which is the beta offering, is $37 billion today. Uh, it's just extraordinary growth. And today, the big asset management shift that I believe um, will come in alternatives. And mm -hmm. we talked about Blue Owl. We talked about this private credit. Uh, and if you think about some of the firms, the AUM, KKR, Blackstone, Palo, Blue Owl, we're talking about two and a half trillion against, you know, over a hundred trillion of investable assets globally. Uh, and so just a yeah. small shift investor appetite, uh, for that is tremendous opportunity, uh, for alternative firms. So when I sit here today, I am extraordinarily excited, uh, about the opportunity and alternatives, uh, and the shift. And I believe it's, going to bring responsible returns for investors uh, in terms of higher returns uh, through these private credit investments that we see over time and provide better investor access. So uh, private investors, retail investors will now get access to Blackstone Apollo products that were typically only for institutional benefit. And so I, I, I see that as an incredible opportunity for those firms to do well for the community as well as uh, shareholders benefit. And I just, I, I, I brought this with me, um, but on the fourth quarter call at Apollo, this was the quote. And I think this is for all of those thinking about sector funds uh, in 2008, this is what the CEO said in 2008, we were 44 billion of AUM. If you fast forward, we've grown 14 times. So it's over 600 billion. That is faster than Apple's revenue, faster than Microsoft's revenue. That's faster than semiconductors. Uh, it's truly extraordinary. So, uh, and, you know, it trades a pretty compelling multiple today. Uh, and 
that is incredible execution, incredible opportunity. And here's a guy with that previous visibility who's now telling you, you know, we could double and triple our business over the next couple of years at mm -hmm. alternative fee rates, which are, you know, are very desirable and a value proposition for clients in the marketplace uh, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, so uh, again, you can, you can buy those firms, you can join with us, uh, but I, I think people should really understand the opportunity set for those firms. Uh, and uh, again, I think a very narrow set will succeed disproportionately. Uh, and because of their skill sets, their scale, and their abilities. Uh, but this will be uh, a major component to the growth in uh, financial services. you got to be there. Well, Mac, I think this has been an incredible overview of a lot of different financial services companies and banks, insurance, asset managers, alternative asset managers. Uh, so thanks again for, for being on Compounders and educating our listeners on a space that we really haven't focused on that much. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate uh, the time. Appreciate it.